We're in a super exciting space, Joey. I'm really excited for the next few years. I think AI and VP is converging and they'll complement each other nicely. AI does cut down on some of the sort of tedious tasks in VP. The more work it cuts down there, the more time we can spend on set shooting better stuff. Real quick, you're watching VP Land. Special thanks to our sponsors for helping make our NEB coverage possible, Blackmagic and Atomos. And now back to the video. All right, I'm here with Addy from Disguise. Hi, Addy. Good to hey, see you. Hey, Joey. Nice to uh, see you here. Thanks for coming to our party last night. Yeah, that was fun. So, for now, if people are not familiar, just give me a brief overview. What is Disguise? Yeah, absolutely. So, we're a global technology platform. We make these incredible high performance servers and a software that controls them. And Disguise powers not just film and TV and broadcast, but also concerts all over the world. We've been around for about two decades, so if there's any major concert on the planet, let's say your Taylor Swift or your Beyonce, it's going to be powered by Disguise, all of the LED walls behind the performers, broadcast, you have ESPN. We're even in fixed install spaces like the Sphere, for example, right here in Vegas, Allegiant Stadium, and film and TV. So a lot of the shoots on the major blockbuster films that use car process work tend to run on disguise. Nice. Yeah. And what's the evolution been like as you started with stage, live production, but then yeah. got into virtual production? What's that? Uh, uh, what are some of the differences too that you've kind of had to like adapt to? Yeah, I think uh, the biggest delta for me going from the studio world to now in the manufacturing world is now I'm on the other end of the equation. Uh, so as a, as a studio technician uh, for a long part of my career, I was using technology like this guy to make the creative goals happen internally. And we were doing a lot of next gen stuff uh, when I was at DreamWorks. So we were doing early on motion capture work, camera tracking, location scouting, real-time rendering a little bit before Unreal and even with Unreal. And uh, a lot of that skill set, I didn't know this at the time, would transfer over to today, where VP is an actual industry and it's got a very specific sort of specification to it. We generally associate it with ICVFX and LED volume work. So I think all of that culminated to where I am today. In a lot of ways, it's uh, a straight path and in some ways it's luck. Yeah, just yeah. like every yeah. <laughs> career path or like, industries that didn't exist and now exist now, yeah. which actually is a good way for AI. You've been using Kubrick, the integrated Kubrick into the disguise system. Yeah. What was the thought behind that and sort of where that fits into different VAD options? Absolutely. So the thought behind it, if I were to distill it all down, is Disguise is a Swiss army knife of a platform, right? With one platform, you should be able to do everything whether it's Unreal Engine or Notch or Touch Designer and even you know simpler stuff like driving plates and video playback. How about next gen, right? So as the world is building these next gen technologies like Kubrick, Stable Diffusion, like Volinga, Nerfs and Gaussian Splats, this guy should be able to integrate with them. So that's the thought process is we wanna give our users as much value, as much use cases as possible all from a single system. Nice. And what kind of use cases have you found where maybe something with Kubrick and a 2.5D background makes sense versus we need to build out a full Unreal yeah. like uh, location or a set? Absolutely. I think uh, building out very expensive Unreal Engine 3D environments makes sense for very expensive film shoots where that's absolutely necessary. You need the photorealism, you need the control over all of that set pieces in that environment. For commercials, it tends to be just easier and the time requirements are small, the budgets are small. So a lot of times I think the next gen stuff like Kubrick 2.5D fit there. Although you don't have maybe perhaps as much of a quality or control, in certain cases budget and time constraint wins over those things. So it's all just a balance of what the production wants. Right. Yeah. Besides just background, yeah. have you been seeing any other the practical uses of AI or things that it might be able to streamline, make things easier? Oh yeah, I'm a big fan of just using Leonardo.ai just for day to day. So I do a lot of PowerPoints, decks and slides, and I, I just do a lot of stable diffusion, throw images on my deck. So just from a day to day, I use- Is that a slide generator? So it's a image generator, and they also now support um, PNG generation with alpha channel. So you can actually create 2.5D that way. Okay, so, um, so you can like generate an image and then kind of mask out what you want to absolutely. cut out. Yeah, and then I use autopod.fm for podcasts. It's a, it's a podcast editing plugin for Premiere. I believe it's AI powered. And then I also use V.io, which is a, a software as a service a video a platform online. It uses AI to decipher voice, turn it into captions, 
uses AI to take out jump cuts and silences from videos. You're a content creator. Yeah. <laughs> you know all about that stuff. I do some content creating as well. So yeah, and then of course, ChatGPT for day-to-day -day sort of uh, just grammatical correction and just cleaning. Again, I do a lot of presentations and uh, I do understand the need for word economy and the correct use of words in correct situations. So ChatGPT helps me with that. Yeah, yeah. that has a lot of practical uses you've been uh, yeah. getting out of it. <laughs> Have you seen anything else uh, like applied like outside of your personal use, like in bigger productions or uh, that's been streamlining workflows besides sort of like the mid journey script for making mood boards, like yeah. any other kind of um, uses on, on, on uh, bigger productions? Yeah, uh, so I can't really speak for bigger productions. Generally, that tends to be closed door, disguised yeah. technicians uh, can't get in there. I've certainly seen uh, some AI usage for smaller commercial work, especially in Asia, uh, where I travel to frequently. We have a lot of customers there. They're very, very quick to adopt uh, stable diffusion and AI and use it for shoots. Uh, I've seen several marketing shoots being used that way. Uh, so yeah. For the backgrounds or for other uses? For as backgrounds, well? yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of their own stable yeah. diffusion stuff. They also really like nerfs and Gaussian squats as well. Yeah, have you been seeing that yeah. as well? Like maybe they scan a scene, scan a location, and bring it into. Uh, yeah, so uh, if you Google or look for SK Telecom, South Korea Telecom, one of our big customers in South Korea. They did a fantastic video about going on location, shooting it practically, and then scanning it and bringing it back into the stage for pickup shots. And I think that's that's the golden use case, yeah. is uh, you don't necessarily want to replace all on location shooting, but you want to have a good safe backup because you're always going to need those reshoots. I've been hearing that more and more too, like maybe in the future, you know, you get room tone and you get yeah. a scan of your scene or your location and you have that. Later Forever. Backup. Yeah. Yeah. You need to do another location. If people are trying to get into VP, what's the best way to do it? And also, what do you feel like are some misconceptions people might have around <laughs> VP? I think the, the biggest misconception with VP is that it's too complex and too difficult and it's not a core uh, tool set of filmmaking, sort of. I would disagree with that. I think VP combines a lot of the core tenets of filmmaking into a new next gen tool. So, for example, cinematography is still very much the same thing. It just happens to have new tool sets and a slightly different way to use it. You still need to generate content stuff on the wall and that's traditional artistry. Uh, you still need to production manage the entire thing so a producer could come in and do that. The best place to start is with free online tutorial. So this guy has to say, where, where, where are hundreds yeah. of hours of online tutorials. So you could learn this guy's to a, quite a few degrees higher than you would think, uh, all online, all for free. Unreal Engine has a learning platform that's yeah. excellent. I've myself learned from that. And then once you're ready to sort of step up and commit to some on-location shooting, we have the Virtual Production Accelerator. We run it in LA, New York, Barcelona, London. Pick your location, come in for three to four days, learn with us. We go from the basics where we talk about cameras and lenses and color signs, all the way to how Unreal should be built and leveraged to actual shooting on set. Yeah. That's awesome. And last one, next few years, what are you looking forward to most in the virtual production industry? <laughs> we're, we're in a super exciting space, Joey. I'm really excited for the next few years. I think AI and VP is converging and they'll complement each other nicely. AI does cut down on some of the sort of tedious tasks in VP, not necessarily content generation, but perhaps also from production management standpoint, just uh, generating previs and those things. I think the more work it cuts down there, the more time we can spend on set shooting better stuff. Um, so definitely looking forward to more AI solutions, as well as just the tools themselves becoming better. So for example, we're here at the row booth mm. and they have a new panel that's RGBW, which is gonna give you better lighting on actors, better skin tone reproduction. They also have another panel that's RGBAC, red, green, blue, amber, cyan, which is even a better color reproduction. And so that's just on the LED panel side. So we're gonna see improvements also on the processor side, on the media service side, on the camera tracking side. And um, I mean, you can go on about the lighting as well. All of the tools are just becoming better and this is gonna lead to a better quality. Actually, I do wanna to ask to follow up though to that one because yeah, um, yeah it, the more specific panels coming out, can you talk a bit more about that because this originally started with panels for displays, for stages, yeah. not yeah. for yeah. lighting people. So like what's been yeah. the evolution in how these panels have been used and adapted and some of the challenges with like color science and color accuracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's such a good question. So yeah, you do know sort of the, the secret that most people don't know is these panels behind us were not really designed for in-camera work. And yet here we are doing in-camera work. 
So I think the big manufacturers like Ro, they are recognizing that. And the good thing is, uh, I could speak for the BB2 V2 panels, for example, they are just so good at what they do right now anyway. It certain just tends to work for in-camera work, but now that they're adding a smaller pixel pitch, because that's really important for mm -hmm. in-camera work, better color reproduction and uh, better rigging for you know building walls quickly. These are the small minute improvements that are coming and you can have these things at the same price as the panels today and it's just better for us, right? So we get to benefit from all of that engineering. Yeah, look yeah. Cool. Thanks a lot, Addy. Yeah, man. Thank you. And that is it for this episode. Be sure to check out the rest of our NAB coverage over here at this playlist and hit the subscribe button for more videos like this. Thanks for watching. I will catch you in the next episode.